Hi, everyone, and welcome to this virtual webinar on AB 3088, the Tenant, Homeowner, and Small Landlord Relief and Stabilization Act of 2020, also known as the COVID-19 Relief Act. From the State Capitol here in Sacramento, I'm Brian Green. Glad to have you all joining us. Generally, AB 3088, which was signed into law during the final week of the legislative session a month ago at the end of August, provides temporary stability and relief for California's residential renters and landlords. In essence, it keeps California housed until February 1st of 2021, next year. The issue of housing was at a critical breaking point even before the pandemic, and now COVID-19 has exacerbated issues surrounding affordability and access. And every branch of government has been tackling this issue since it unfolded earlier this year. Uh, the governor has issued uh, several executive orders to waive state laws. The Judicial Council has uh, issued emergency rules to slow freeze certain tenant court proceedings. And the federal government and the local governments have issued various rules to provide additional protections. AB 3088 reflects a compromise between various stakeholders, the Senate, the Assembly, and the administration to provide a statewide bridge and additional time to sort out what lies ahead, including whether there will be federal relief and whether we will see further public health improvements related to COVID-19 pandemic. And while this tenant landlord relief is temporary and there is more to be done when the legislature comes back, AB 3088 does provide some significant protections to your constituents in the meantime. And on this live webinar, we are bringing together staff from the California Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency and the Legal Aid Association of California to provide an overview of the law, some suggestions about how your offices can field questions from your constituents, and we will answer some pre-submitted questions that have come in about the new law. So first up, let me introduce you to our webinar participants, all of us who are socially distanced across the, the city of Sacramento and across the state to uh, engage in this conversation. First up, our panelists from the California Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency, Phil Laird, who is the Deputy Counsel, Lynn Von Koch-Liebert, who is the Deputy Secretary of Housing, Amy Wilson, who is the Deputy Secretary for Legislation, Miles White, the Assistant Director of Legislation, and Russ Heimerich, who is the Deputy for Communications. Ladies and gentlemen from the agency, welcome. Good to see you. And also from the Legal Aid Association of California, we have Lauren Klein, who is the Directing Attorney, and Rianne Pacheco, who is the Advocacy Associate. So Lauren and Rianne, welcome. Glad to have you here. I want just for the sake of time, and I know we have staff logging on to get this information as soon as possible. I know it's been all hands on deck for everyone as this legislation was signed into law and we're trying to implement as much as possible and clarify to constituents and to staff. I want to allow uh, the agency, uh, the Con Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency staff to uh, begin their presentation uh, and, and get into the discussion and clarification that everybody wants to hear. So Phil and team, welcome again. Uh, feel free to start at any time you're ready with your presentation. Great, thank you so much, Brian, appreciate that. Um, so first off, good morning, everybody. Uh, happy Tuesday. Um, so today, sort of as Brian alluded to, um, we're really gonna be discussing specifically kind of the parameters of AB 3088. And to Brian's point, there's a lot of eviction protections um, in addition out there beyond um, just what's covered in the state law, but just so everybody understands, this is mainly to really kind of dissect and explain the, the kind of nuanced components of this new bill that just went into effect on August 31st. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now for our presentation. And um, one thing I just wanna point out, what we're sharing is actually part of a PowerPoint presentation that's been put together um, by my colleagues at BCSH and at Department of Real Estate with the goal of uh, this being a resource for folks uh, in positions like yours, where they are community partners and leaders that are in contact a lot of times with those um, tenants in most need of these protections um, so that they can maybe be armed with this information to uh, um, help get the word out and spread the word about the protections that may be available to tenants. So I, I just wanna mention that um, because this is a resource that um, if it's not already available, I know my colleague will be discussing sort of how it will be available on the housingiskey.com website um, that we're hosting right now. And so just with that introduction, that's, that's sort of what I'll be pulling from. I will not be going through the full 
presentation uh, today. I will really be kind of laser focused on sort of explaining AB 3088. Um, but to begin, I did want to go through one part of the presentation that I thought is really a great kind of component. I apologize as I kind of jump through some of this. And that is, um, we've kind of come up with a handy acronym with the idea being, there's a lot of information here. You're going to hear a lot this morning about sort of the various parameters of AB 3088. And yet, uh, it's a lot to retain. And so we kind of have boiled it down to some of the most important things we, we hope folks will retain and be able to then pass along to constituents as needed. And, and we're using the acronym SAFE, and right, the goal is that we want people to stay safe in their homes during this pandemic. So the S is uh, just that, stay in their home. And uh, the point we want to emphasize there, and this isn't something that applies in AB 3088, this is just sort of a, a fact of life, unfortunately, and that is um, a lot of tenants, you know, will get some sort of notice about an eviction on their house. And almost every time they get that notice, um, that notice is not saying you've been evicted. It's simply communicating that maybe the eviction process is beginning. And so what we want to emphasize here is that, you know, just because you get a notice on your door does not mean you should immediately move out in most cases. And so um, one thing we can help tenants understand is, you know, they, they should pause before they sort of jump the gun here on, on kind of moving everything out of their homes and really try to seek some help and uh, figure out where they might be protected and how they might be able to stay under, in their homes. That leads me very well to our second point, A, which is advice from a lawyer is key. Really one of the main things we, we hope to do for tenants is connect them to legal help. And so I know we have our uh, some partners from Legal Aid um, here to talk about sort of how to identify and find those resources later on this morning. Um, but that is always, I think, you know, uh, one of the points we like to make in tandem and that is uh, stay in your home and get help as soon as possible. Um, F then, this really is AB 3088 specific, and that is uh, the form that we'll be discussing must be returned within 15 days of receiving a notice to pay or quit. Now this form we're talking about, I'll go into more detail, I will show an example, uh, but it's essentially a declaration that a tenant uh, who finds himself in the situation where they're unable to pay rent and they've received that notice to pay or quit um, uh, can submit this declaration uh, uh, to their landlord and it will essentially, in many instances, uh, protect them temporarily, if not permanently, from eviction for that non-payment of rent. So uh, if anything you remember about AB 3088, this is probably the crux because it's the part that the tenant really has to kind of affirmatively take a step to, to be protected under this act. And finally, E is everything should be documented. This is just another one of those good uh, words of wisdom, good piece of advice. Um, you know, in, in terms of in, in case they end up in a court situation or just kind of entering into further negotiations with their landlord, uh, documentation really is key to be able to show what you paid when, um, that you submitted a declaration under this, uh, the provisions of this new law. Uh, things like that that really will be crucial it, down the line, for instance, if they do end up in front of a judge. So uh, we'll, we'll try to come back to this one more time at the end of my presentation, but safe, try to keep it in mind as we go forward. So I'm going to jump forward and actually, let's see, I did want to stop on this because I actually want to preemptively answer one of the questions we received in advance. I think it was the first one, which was uh, the question was, what is a notice to pay or quit? Great question. This is not, you know, uh, normal terminology as, as we would uh, usually, usually consider it. But basically a notice to pay or quit is a notice that you have missed your rent payment that was due. For instance, say rent is due the first of every month. And on the second or third of the month, your landlord's thinking, I wasn't paid. I wasn't paid on time. At that point, what happens is then they can post this notice, you know, usually on your door or deliver it to you in person or, you know, via mail sometimes. But essentially the notice um, will say, you have so much time before you either have to pay me that rent that you were supposed to pay me a few days ago or vacate the premises. Uh, we use this very old fashioned terminology, which is quit the premises. But um, anyways, that that it's a long winded way of saying this is the usually known as the, you know, basically pay or get out. Um, what the uh, what AB 3088 does is it does add um, sort of a third option now. And that is that the land that the tenant can submit this declaration, uh, asserting that they've experienced a COVID-19 related financial hardship. And that will uh, uh, also be a method where they can stay in their homes um, and not pay or quit. So um, we can clarify that further if there's more questions on that. But when you hear me talk about notice to pay or quit, that's what we're talking about. It's a notice that says you haven't paid rent, you owe that rent, you either need to pay or get out. Okay, so jumping into the details, let's see. 
So AB 3088, who does it apply to? First off, we just want to clarify, it applies to residential tenants. This is not applicable to commercial tenants. Um, but so anybody uh, where the, where the uh, place they're living is a, is a home and that's what they're renting it for, uh, this is for them. And we just want to clarify too that this applies regardless of immigration status and whether or not you have a formal lease. There's really not a requirement there. You were in a tenancy if you were paying rent uh, you know, on a monthly basis to be in your home. Uh, it also applies to mobile home parks. Um, so uh, tenants both renting spaces or actual mobile homes are also protected by this law. Um, I'm going to skip this one for now and just jump straight to the meat of it. So um, AB 3088, uh, what is the eviction for? Um, so essentially, you know, one of, one of the ways I can break this down most easily is there's sort of two buckets of eviction protections under this bill. One is for when you've missed uh, rent or you'll be unable to pay rent sometime between March 1st, 2020 and January 31st, 2021. Um, then there are other reasons. So I'm going to focus right now, you know, I think what a lot of people understand and are hearing about is this whole thing about I'm protected even if I can't pay my rent. So we're going to kind of go down that path first. And then at the end, I'll come back to sort of the other protections that also appear in this bill, just so folks have awareness. So moving on with uh, financial uh, uh, issues first. So um, essentially what happens is, as we mentioned, um, under the bill, a tenant may receive a notice to pay or quit. Now, one thing that's immediately different under AB 3088 is um, if it's for rent that was missed between March 1st, 2020 and January 31st, 2020, uh, it is now a 15 day notice to pay rent or quit. Now under the law previously, this is typically a three day notice to pay or quit. So this has really substantially increased the timeline given tenants a lot longer window here to kind of figure out whether or not they have the finances to pay the rent or get this declaration in. Um, and this is 15 days, not including weekends or holidays. So in most cases, you're looking at 21 or 22 days um, that a tenant has to uh, essentially take some sort of action once they've received this notice. And then the landlords are required to now provide not only sort of a specific notice that really explains this to the tenants that they have 15 days to take certain actions, but then also um, uh, give the tenant essentially a blank declaration form. And so the declaration is called the Declaration of COVID-19 Financial Distress. And um, it's a, essentially a declaration under uh, penalty of perjury that the tenant has experienced some sort of COVID-19 related financial distress. I'm gonna go into that a little bit further in a minute, um, but you know, really emphasizing on this slide that um, returning then this declaration within 15 business days to your landlord is probably the most important component of this bill. It's what triggers then the protections for the tenant, especially then I'll go into a little further depending on when they've missed rent or, or when they've been un unable to pay their rent. So this is typically what a 15 day notice to pay or quit will look like. This is actually the form that's been supplied for landlords on Department of Real Estate's web, um, website. Usually there'll be more to this just because there might be other laws that require additional information, but at a minimum, it's going to require this information. So your tenant will often see something that looks like this if that's in fact what the landlord is attempting to evict them for, for failing to pay their rent. Um, so, you know, this is just an example. Again, this can be found on the Housing is Key website that I know uh, my colleague Lynn will be demonstrating in a little bit. And then this, probably even more importantly, is what the Declaration of COVID-19 Related Financial Distress looks like. Uh, also available on our Housing is Key website. Again, the landlord is, is required to provide this to the tenant with that notice to pay or quit. So they should have a copy of it, but we do have it available on our website if, uh, if they lose it or if somehow it wasn't provided to them. And um, it really defines exactly what is meant by COVID-19 related financial distress. And you'll see it's pretty, pretty um, broad. It does not require that the tenant actually had COVID-19. It's really um, that they've experienced some sort of loss of income uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, that they've maybe had increased ex uh, health expenses, that they have increased childcare responsibilities or expenses, things that are affecting their pocketbook as, as, a, uh, as a cause of this whole pandemic and the economic fallout that it's caused. So um, uh, then, but then the, the requirement at the bottom, as you see, is that the tenant does need to sign this. And again, I mentioned that it's under penalty of perjury. They need to actually have experienced a COVID-19 related financial hardship and then dated and then return it to their landlord. 
So how to fill out and return the form, the tenant should sign the form. And then as I said, again, I'm repeating myself a lot because I want some of this to stick. And that is then they should provide it to their landlord within 15 business days. Um, and each tenant named uh, in the notice should sign and return the form. Um, essentially your protections are unique to yourself, not necessarily for the entire household. So uh, you know, for everybody that's mentioned on that notice, everybody should submit a declaration if they, if they wish to be protected under the law. Um, and then there's a number of ways they can then submit this declaration. Essentially, the law says if the notice says, uh, gives these options, they can deliver it in person or by mail to their landlord at the address provided on the notice, or by email if the landlord provides an email, or uh, by any method that they typically submit their uh, payments for rent, if that's possible. So obviously, an automatic you know, automatic uh, bank transfer, you can't submit a declaration necessarily in the memo part or anything like that. But um, if, you know, they typically send their check in the mail to a certain address, they can then send this declaration that same means. Um, and another key point is that um, it, it's very possible that a landlord will uh, give a new notice to pay or quit each month that tenant fails to pay their rent. It's important that the tenant does continue to uh, complete that declaration again and submit it again within 15 uh, business days. Um, that just ensures protection under the law and makes sure there's, and makes sure that there isn't some, some sort of uh, issue where um, somehow they've lost the protections because they didn't uh, adequately return that notice. And then finally, as we mentioned before, it's very important that a tenant keep a record of providing this declaration to their landlord. Um, you know, a picture on your phone, a mail receipt, you know, sending it by certified mail, something that can help them show uh, either their landlord or a court, if it comes to it, that they did in fact uh, timely submit that declaration. Um, now, other things to make to know about the form is uh, first and foremost, um, and this is most tenants, and that is if they make under a hundred thousand dollars a year, there's no requirement that they actually provide proof to their landlord that they've experienced that financial hardship. All the law requires is that they give that signed declaration. Uh, over $100,000 a year and over 130% AMI of their county. I know this is kind of complex stuff. Um, it's possible that a landlord could request for proof and that the tenant would be required to provide it. But that's, to be honest, rarely going to be the case. And if it is the case, um, uh, uh, there's sort of uh, within the notice the landlord's required to give that tenant, it describes the types of things they can show to prove that they've experienced that hardship. Um, if the tenant is unable to sign the form in 15 days, I just want to mention that there may be additional protections um, uh, in terms of another opportunity uh, during a court process to actually then deliver that declaration directly to the court. That again has some nuanced rules around it. And so again, if we're getting to that question, this is a really important time that you should be directing that tenant to legal help because they really will need some individual uh, um, legal assistance at that point to kind of navigate this appropriately. And then again, that's also the last point, and that is always, always direct them then to legal, legal help. Um, because again, these are very complicated laws and everybody's circumstances are usually different depending on sort of where they are and what their housing uh, situation is. So always directing them to get that personalized help. So now let's talk about when we're saying protected, what are we talking about? How are they protected from eviction? So it does depend somewhat on when they missed that rent or when their rent was due and they were unable to pay. And uh, so we kind of tried to put this down into a chart that hopefully is helpful to everybody that's uh, you know, for you visual learners out there. Um, basically the law AB 3088 um, identifies two kind of s separate parts of time. And that is the March 1st to August 31st, 2020 window, which is behind us, it's past, um, we're not still in it. Uh, and that's known as the protected period under the law, but it's not important that you know that. And then there's also September 1st, which is essentially when this law went into effect until January 31st of next year. Um, the protections are slightly different, but depending on when they owed rent for. So for this past period, if that tenant timely returns that declaration of, of COVID-19 financial hardship, they can never be evicted for failing to pay that rent that was due between March 1st and August 31st. So that they're good to go. They can't be evicted on that basis. Um, now, uh, if they timely return that declaration for the second window of time, um, uh, that protects them through January 31st, 2021. Um, but technically, if they do nothing more, they could then potentially be evicted uh, following, following January 31st. Now, how they can protect themselves permanently is by paying 25% of the total rent they owed 
between September 1st and January 31st. Now, one thing I'll point out about the law is it doesn't require that you pay 25% in monthly installments or anything like that. The tenant can pay it however they want. They can wait until January 31st, 2021 and pay it in one lump sum. But essentially they have to pay at least 25% of the rent that was due between September 2020 and January 2021 uh, to their landlord and have also timely uh, submitted that declaration. Even if it was given to them multiple times, they had to then submit it multiple times. And that will permanently protect them just like the first period from eviction for, for failing to pay that rent. Um, so I know that's a little confusing. Uh, feel free to uh, kind of jot this down or take a screenshot of this. And I think a, a copy of this PowerPoint will be made available later too, if you kind of need this help. But then um, I think the, the outstanding question, right, is you're hearing, okay, well, they can't be evicted, but what about what they owe? That's an important question. And the point is the tenant still owes this missed rent. Um, and so they can't be evicted for it. They can't be forced to leave their homes because they didn't pay that rent. However, their landlord still can sue them for that rent if, if they choose to. Um, and they'll still be liable to pay that rent to the landlord. So a little bit more on sort of what that looks like. Um, really, a, a landlord can technically sue their tenant at any point for unpaid rent. So for rent they haven't paid, you know, during the pandemic already, they could already technically proceed with a lawsuit. However, under AB 3088, um, beginning March 1st, 2021, a landlord can actually use the small claims court process to attempt to collect this unpaid rent. And that's regardless of how much how much is owed. So typically, right, small claims court has uh, got a cap of a certain dollar amount. Uh, that's waived for um, these situations where a landlord is seeking to recover this COVID-19 rental debt. And so um, that will be a process that becomes available to landlords on March 1st. Um, that said, we'd like to emphasize that residents will be treated equally in the courts. Courts don't care about immigration status and it won't appear on any of the small claims court paperwork. It's not relevant evidence to any of this. And so um, uh, it, it really can't be brought up in that context. So moving along, I'm not gonna focus on this, but just to really point out again, folks should remember that no matter what the housing situation is, tenants are always protected from retaliation and harassment um, for exercising their, their rights um, under this law. And then also uh, you know, to the extent they, they fall into a protected category of persons. Uh, as I mentioned before, keeping records continues to be very, very important. Um, it'll help establish you know, that you timely submitted that declaration, that you uh, paid a portion of your rent between September and January if you're trying to get that permanent protection. And that also, um, you, know, you can also keep documentation of times maybe your landlord has acted unlawfully or inappropriately, and that may become relevant in terms of whether or not they're taking a lawful action against the tenant. Okay, so I know that was a lot. We'll, we'll keep going, and, and again, uh, hopefully, hopefully, uh, if we need to answer questions later on after this presentation, we we can provide provide some follow up. But as I mentioned, there's other other causes, other reasons where you can protect, be protected from eviction under AB 3088. Um, so moving along, this is kind of it in a slide, in a nutshell, and that is until February 1st, 2021, a landlord can actually only evict a tenant, and that's any tenant. I'm not talking about tenants who just failed to pay their rent. This is the law across the state until February 1st, they can only evict a tenant if they um, state a legally valid reason. And so the, the distinction I'd like to make there is that um, there are often times where a landlord um, serves their tenant with a notice essentially to, to vacate the premises. Usually it's called like a 30 or 60 day notice. It's a longer window than usually like that three day or 15 day paraquit. And basically the reason is no reason. It's just that your lease is up and um, you know it's been great, but we're, we're going to go ahead and have you move out now. And no reason is stated. Um, that is not a lawful um, reason to evict a, a tenant in California until February 1st, 2021. And even then, there's sort of new laws that went into effect last year that could protect a lot of tenants in a similar situation. I'm not going to go into that in great detail right now, but just to really kind of hammer home that right now they have to state a legally valid reason um, oftentimes uh, that can be, you know, for um, reasons that are uh, the tenant's fault, like they breached another material part of their lease or criminal activities going on on the property, that those would be valid reasons. Or it could be um, uh, no fault to the tenant, for instance, that the landlord is um, seeking to essentially move into the house themselves or um, a few other protections in there. So the, these are referred to often uh, as just cause protections. And so just really emphasize that if somebody gets a different kind of eviction notice, it's once again, always recommended that they seek 
uh, legal help because they maybe find out that they're protected either under this law or another federal, state, or local law that actually doesn't require them to move out, even though their landlord is attempting to get them to move out. So uh, also just want to uh, make a plug that we're, we're trying to roll out as much kind of digestible informational material here. So a lot of what I've covered is in this one pager, which again, if it's not already on our website, will be on the Housing is Key website shortly. Um, you know, this is a great kind of reference cheat for you all uh, as you kind of try to recall everything I said or remember the components of the SAFE acronym. And it tries to provide sort of an overview. Uh, we also on our website, as Lynn will demonstrate, have other kind of similar informational documents like this. And I believe that's where I'm going to stop for now. Um, appreciate you all listening to me talk nonstop for so long. But at this point, I will go ahead and turn it over for our next segment, I believe, to our colleague, Lynn. OK, thank you, Phil. Um, can everybody see my screen? Yeah, we can see. You. OK, OK, great. All right. Um, well, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Lynn Von Copley-Bert, and as mentioned before, I'm the Deputy Secretary of, of Housing at BCSH. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just give you a quick overview of where all the resources are located so that um, should you be looking to um, understand more about this bill or if a constituent contacts you, you have easy at your hands all of the information that Phil has provided, plus some more tools and resources that we've put together. Um, so the first thing is that we have created um, the Housing is Key uh, new website. And currently that directs you to the Department of Real Estate's Landlords, Tenants, New Landing page. Um, we will continue to be pushing out more information through Housing is Key. And so um, as things continue to evolve, we'll continue to use Housing is Key as our predominant landing place. Um, and then the tenant and landlord resources specifically will continue to evolve and build up with under the Department for Real Estate. Um, so right now, this page is really focused on um, AB 3088 but we'll also continue to, to grow and expand the resources and information that's available. Um, for instance, uh, tomorrow we are expecting to have the updated landlord tenant guide posted on this site as well. Um, so I'm just going to give you a quick walkthrough of the website and the resources that are embedded here and then just would encourage everybody to, um, to visit, to explore, um, to provide any feedback and to let us know what else would be helpful for you to see on this site. Um, so the way that we have split this up is we have focused on the, the entities that are both benefited and may be asked for the, the, place, the organizations that are being asked for support in this place. So we have tenant, landlords, homeowners, and then also community partners. Um, so if you look under the different sections, um, you can see that we provided kind of a breakout of the guidelines itself, just an overview of what the, what the bill actually does. Um, also, you'll see you can get to fact sheets um, that are a, you're able to print out, um, to review, to give to constituents, etc. Um, also, we're continuing to keep a rolling frequently asked questions. Um, so as we get asked, as we um, get asked more information, we'll continue to update these FAQs and keep them relevant. Um, we're also translating as much as we can into Spanish. So you'll see, especially for items like the fact sheet, there is a Spanish version available. Okay. Um, okay, so going back. Okay, so return. There we go. Um, so continuing through, we have the guidance. Then we also have a very important report, which is the forms. So as Phil mentioned, a lot of the actions with the bill um, really do start with the, the sharing and the completion of the forms. So here we have the COVID-19 related financial distress form, and it has been translated into English, Chinese, Korean, Spanish, Tagalog, and Vietnamese. So if you have a constituent who's looking for those forms in their, in their um, selected language, um, you can find those forms here. And they've been designed so that they're easy to print, to share, to, to copy, to photograph, et cetera. And then we also are continuing to build out an ongoing list of resources for tenants, landlords, and homeowners. Um, so in this case, you can see what we have under tenants is we have the lists of eviction moratoriums by city or county. As Phil mentioned, there are additional protections that may um, may pertain to an individual by their location. So we have this list running list here. 
Um, we also have, again, the, the, the frequently asked questions, the fact sheets, and then we also have lists to the HUD approved housing counseling agencies and the legal aid societies and advocacy groups that may be available to help individuals. Um, we are pretty cognizant that this is a lot to absorb, um, especially given that this was a bill that went into effect with an urgency clause and became um, law um, at, when, at the point that the governor signed it. Um, so for that reason, we have created two tools to be able to help both individuals who are navigating their protections and their obligations under this law, as well as those like yourselves who may be in the position to help individuals who, who are. So the first one that I want to go through is this California COVID-19 information app for tenants and landlords. Um, so it's located very prominently here, right on the, um, the housing is key page. And um, so we'll go ahead and click into this. And this is an interactive tool that allows a user to answer a series of questions to get a more personalized report that provides information and resources that are specific to their situation. Um, we developed this in partnership with UC Irvine and a technology company called um, Neolotica. And right now it's in English, but we're also working to translate the app into Spanish in the coming weeks. Um, so we envisioned that this could be used by an individual who's working to gain a better understanding of how this law applies to them, but also by a community partner who may be helping an individual navigate this. Um, so I'm going to give you a quick, uh, quick demonstration of how this app works, um, but of course there are many, many iterations of how this can be run. So again, I'd encourage you to, to log in, explore, and become a little bit more familiar with it. Um, so right off the bat, um, you choose between if you're a tenant or landlord. So for this demonstration, we'll go ahead and choose tenant, and then you click let's determine my rights. Um, here you start with um, a disclaimer about what this app is and isn't. And then this important first question is, have you suffered financial distress caused by COVID-19? Um, whenever we have new terminology that's introduced either through this bill or that's something that is a little bit more complicated, we try to have um, a hyperlink which pr provides a direct um, definition so that you can the, the user can, as they're going through this, be able to get the information directly within the app. Um, so we're gonna go and say it and say yes. And then are you currently homeless? Um, the standard user would probably say no, but if you did say yes, then the report that you're going to get at the end would include resources for somebody who is experiencing homelessness. Okay, and then here comes the important question. Did you, do you currently owe rent to your landlord? So we're going to go ahead and say yes. And then here are the two buckets that, that Phil mentioned. Um, so in this, for this example, we'll choose the March 1 to August 31st, the protected period. Um, have you received a notice to pay or quit? Um, we'll, we'll select no. And again, if you need a definition of notice to pay or quit, you can hover over that and it will pop up. Um, and then the next couple of questions are to be able to understand the individual's area median income and whether or not they're above or below that $100,000 threshold. Um, so in this case, we'll just choose four people in the household. Um, we'll say income of 42,000 and um, humble. Okay, and that's it. So we're really expecting this to take about two minutes for somebody to complete if they have access to all that information. So then you show your report. And what this will provide is it provides um, an overview of the situation based off of your response. And then it provides a series of guidance. So it tells you um, under the act based off of your situation, um, what, it, what it is that the landlord can and can't do and then gives you more information about um, the, the documentation that you should receive or should have filed, et cetera. Um, it then provides kind of the, the hyperlinks to all the different resources as you go through. So if it's, if it's talking about the notice to pay quit, then it has the link to the form. Um, if it's referencing, we strongly recommend you contact a lawyer, it references you directly to lawhelpca.org. And then it continues to give you information about, about your, your current situation as it, as it, as it applies under this bill. Um, and then um, because we know that um, individuals who may be looking through this may also be facing other housing insecurities, um, we just continue to have um, a generic, um, a fairly generic uh, reference list at the end that gives more information about um, landlord tenant assistance, legal aid, um, and, and also being able to remember um, protections against discrimination and harassment through the Department of Repair, Employment and Housing. And then always, if you need to find resources to begin 
unpaid rent calling your local 211 who may have information if your local jurisdiction has a rental assistance program. Um, you can use this transcript to get a quick uh, summary of what answers you provided. And then finally, you can either print this, this page directly or you can enter in an email and then that will send it to your email so you can have a copy of the report. Okay. So going back to the names page, the other piece that I want to show you today is, um, is this community partners resources section. Um, so coming tomorrow, we will have um, a number of items that are designed to be essentially a toolkit for individuals who are in organizations that may be helping those who are, um, are uh, dealing with eviction um, issues or have questions about these protections under this law. So the content that's going to come up um, starting tomorrow will be the PowerPoint slide deck that Phil went through. And then we're also creating a webinar video that will be essentially um, a speaker such as like, like Phil going through and giving a verbal overview of the slides and interpreting the slide deck for the individual. Um, the, uh, the, the webinar video takes 30 minutes to go through and gives a really great comprehensive training of the bill. Um, we're also going to have the one page tenants right poster, um, which we are designing so that if somebody could print it out, put it on their desk or be able to then also print it and share it with individuals who need assistance. And then also we'll have all of the links to, links to all the relevant forms that we provided in the training. Um, this will be, the whole toolkit will be in English and Spanish. And um, I think with that, that gives um, a summary of the, the information and the resources that we have created. And I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, um, Russ, Russ, who can say a few words about the Housing is Key campaign more broadly and how you can stay engaged to receive additional information as it, as it is available. Uh, thank you, Lynn. Uh, so um, the Housing is Key campaign is a campaign that we actually were uh, thinking about doing before uh, this landlord tenant issue uh, uh, rose up. And what we're looking at doing is sort of bringing all of the housing uh, areas that the state is working on under one umbrella. Right now, our housingiskey.com website redirects to the landlord tenant um, page because that is the pressing issue. But going forward, uh, at some point in the future, we will have a single website with a number of different areas, including landlord tenant, homelessness, affordable housing, that sort of thing. So. Um, uh, stay tuned for that. That is evolving right now, and we are working with the company to um, develop branding for that to um, <clears throat> make sure that we have the, uh, the right resources and the right um, uh, information to put on a, a broader um, um, website. Um, we are uh, also, uh, as part of that, uh, we have a stakeholder list uh, for people that we reach out to. Uh, on, a, on, a, on an ongoing basis. Um, we're about to uh, fire off another email today to bring people up to speed on some of the things that have happened over the last few days. If you would like to be part of that, you can, um, you can email me and I can add you to the um, uh, uh, distribution list. Um, I'm gonna put my email address in the um, uh, chat box. So if you want to email me directly, I'll make sure you get added to the list of people who are uh, uh, added to our stakeholder outreach so that you can get our regular updates. And if, you'll, if you could let me know also uh, if, uh, whose office you're with so that we can add that to our contacts so that we can uh, uh, target our messaging. Um, if there are no questions, uh, happy to turn it back over. If you do have questions, happy to answer them. All right, folks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, folks from the agency. And now I think we'll turn it over to the Legal Aid Association of California and Rhianna Lauren for their presentation on what is it and how to find it for your constituents, meaning legal aid, of course. Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Lauren Klein. I'm with the Legal Aid Association of California. 
We are a statewide association for legal aid nonprofits. So we have more than 100 members all over the state. So no matter what district you're in, there's probably a legal aid organization nearby. Um, and we want to help you out today with that A in safe that Phil mentioned. Um, advice of an attorney is key. If you uh, see a constituent that has gotten an eviction notice, you want to get them to an attorney as quickly as possible. And legal aid is going to be a great option for a lot of your constituents. So we want to make sure you know what legal aid is and then how you can find it for your constituents. Um, legal aid is always provided by a nonprofit um, and legal aid is free civil legal services for low-income people, seniors, and people with disabilities. So I'll go back through that one more time. Free civil legal services. So legal aid services are always free. If you're talking to someone that is charging for legal services, even on a sliding scale, that's not legal aid. Legal aid will always be free. It's civil legal services. So that's just about anything that's not criminal, um, whether it's a domestic violence issue or a healthcare issue, or of course, a landlord tenant issue. Um, legal aid will cover that. Uh, to know who is eligible for legal aid, the basic guidelines is that it's for low-income people. So generally, if someone is at 125% of the federal poverty line or below, they will be eligible for legal aid. But there are exceptions to that rule. Some organizations can take people up to 200% of the federal poverty line. It varies depending on the organization, so it's always good to ask. Um, seniors are also generally eligible for legal aid. Any legal aid organization that's funded through the Older Americans Act um, is, they can take seniors 16 over regardless of their income. Uh, and then same goes for people with disabilities. So that's basically what legal aid is. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Rianne who has created a great tool to help you find legal aid in your district. Thanks, Lauren. Hi, everybody. My name is Leanne again. Um, I am the Advocacy Associate here at LAC. Um, LAC created an online resource for a district for um, legislative staff. And I'm going to show you how to access that in a second. But I did send a direct link to everybody's chief of staff and district directors in hopes that they will distribute it to anybody in the office that does constituent services. If you didn't get that for any reason, I could always just resend it, no problem but I'm gonna show you how to access it right now. Um, this is the Legal Aid Association of California um, homepage. Uh, you're just gonna to go to advocacy and you're gonna to go to legislative caseworker support. <clears throat> and then as you can see here, it's a map of California. Um, it's separated by assembly districts and Senate districts. So let's just do a quick example. You're in the Senate district and let's say you're from district two. So as you can see, you have one, two, three, four organizations in your district that have volunteered their resources and meaning they volunteered their direct contact information for you to have access to. Um, it's gonna be separated by specialties. So here you have Indian rights specialty and you have low income, which you're gonna see pretty often. That just means that um, they probably cover multiple areas of law that you could get help with. Uh, I get a lot of questions of what if my district doesn't have anything under it? Like let's say for District 27 here, that doesn't mean you do not have an organ legal aid organization, legal aid organization in your district. It just purely means that um, they haven't been, been given the opportunity to volunteer their resources directly to like this resource for legislative staff members, um, like their direct contact information. But that also doesn't mean you cannot contact a neighboring uh, district um, to help you with your um, with your constituent issues, constituent needs. Um, organizations can often do go outside their district to help, so that's not an issue here. Um, we really hope to strengthen the connection between legal aid and um, legislative staff members because we know your constituents have legal needs and we just want you to know that uh, legal aid is here to help and they're fully equipped to help. So please look out for emails from LAC. Uh, we are going to be sending you, not bombarding you with emails, but we will send you resources, really important resources for your constituents and you to have access to. So look out for our email. And then lastly, I'm just going to go over law help real quick. Um, so law help, so for the constituent caseworker support, this is for you. This is for the legislative staff member. 
but raw health is something that you could give to your constituents, something that you could give them as a reference, a resource too. Um, it is California's official and legal resource. It is one reliable information about common legal issues and it's written by reputable sources, but also it is an updated directory of legitimate and free screen legal aid organizations that offer free or low cost um, legal advice and representation. So again, please just use these really excellent resources for you. And if you have any questions, I'm gonna put my email into the chat box. And then with that, I'll pass it back over. All right, thank you very much, uh, Rihanna and Lauren, and all of you, thank you so much for the seamless and comprehensive presentation that you're giving us. Uh, both of you uh, from behalf, on behalf of the agency and the Legal Aid Association. And yes, it's a lot of information, but uh, knowledge is peace of mind at this point. So as much as we can get, it's, it's important. We do have some questions right now that have, were pre-submitted and likely some of these questions have touched upon points that you have already brought up in your presentations. But I guess as Phil Laird said earlier, we want this to stick. So, uh, and if you're a repetitive learner like me, the more the merrier, the more times you hear it, the better. So uh, we wanna get these questions out and I will uh, offer a moderator's privilege here and say that even if these particular questions are directed at one participant or another, if you as a participant in this conversation panel want to respond or add some advice on answers on these particular questions, please don't hesitate to chime in. Uh, we want to let those that are watching know that if uh, you have any additional questions, we're not going to take them right now, but uh, please feel free to submit them uh, via the chat or by email. And we do have policy staff, we have pro tem staff standing by, agency staff that will definitely get the answers to your questions as soon as possible. And actually on that note, I was derelict in my duty earlier to acknowledge the participation here uh, as advisory during the course of this conversation with Eric Dang from the Office of the Senate President Pro Tem of Tony Atkins. Uh, he is here listening, taking notes and will do anything he can to help with the Pro Tem's office and other Senate staff, uh, anything he can speak to or respond to specifically, he's standing by and will help before and after this presentation. So ladies and gentlemen, we have some questions. We'll get right to them. Uh, for the form, what happens if the landlord doesn't give the tenant a copy of the form? Should the tenant print out a copy of the form from the agency's website and turn it in? Or does the tenant have additional rights if the landlord doesn't provide the form? So Phil, I don't know if you and your team wanna- Yeah, I can jump in there. Thanks, Brian. Um, so I guess the, the first caveat I should point out, right, is that, uh, you know, in today's presentation, and as I answer these questions, um, you know, this isn't intended to be legal advice. I, I know that was <laughs> referenced earlier. And so I, I will say that um, uh, um, in any situation, even with what we tell you, it's always, of course, really good for the tenant to then also consult with attorney because there, you know, you, you never know if the situation is a little bit different than it was described to you or, or if there, there are other circumstances they haven't shared. That said, in this situation, um, I mean, AB 3088 is pretty explicit that a landlord is required to have complied with all of the notice requirements in the bill. So the notice requires, you know, the, both of that uh, precise language for 15 day pay or quit be included. It also must include the declaration. Um, and then uh, there's a few other components that they have to meet. So I mean, from my position, if it doesn't include that, and what the law basically says is that they uh, that is a deficient notice. And so uh, in most cases, I would assume a court would not um, find that to have been a valid notice because it didn't, didn't include the declaration that was required. Uh, and therefore they won't really uh, uh, continue with the eviction at that point. That said, you know, it, you never know what happens when you end up in court. So that's where I just really advise, um, uh, well, that's sort of on its face what the law says, of course, um, folks should always consult with an attorney in this situation. Um, but yes, the, the landlord does have a duty to comply with all of the notice components, including providing that declaration. And actually I should note too, that um, they're required to provide the declaration in the language that they negotiated the uh, rental agreement in. So just flagging, we provided, you know, the six, uh, five or six different languages that the declarations provided in. That's also a resource for the landlord in the sense that if they had negotiated their, their uh, tenancy with the tenant, um, uh, uh, for instance, in Korean, they're required then to provide that declaration in Korean to their, to their tenant. So 
uh, that, that's a lot of things the landlord has to get right in order for a tenant to then have to take that next step. Um, but that said, uh, and sorry, I, I know I'm going on and on here, but there I'm noticing now the middle question too is should the tenant print out um, a copy of the form from the agency's website and turn it in? Um, I, I mean, the only, I think where we come from is if there's a chance, you know, you just missed the declaration as the tenant and it actually was there and the landlord can prove it you know, to ensure that you're in a situation where you're protected and that you're you're uh, obtaining all the protections. You know, it, it, typically it would seem that'd be better to provide this declaration if you're in that situation, if I'm not quite sure what just happened and what I should do now. Uh, but that said, still, of course, advised to seek legal help because there's also some potential outfall with that as well. Okay, great, thank you. Next question, is the 15 day notice to quit under the law, permanent change to law or just until February 1st of next year? Excellent question. And the answer is the latter is only until February 1st, um, unless, you know, something new is adopted uh, uh, by the legislature uh, early, early next year. And that's actually another opportunity for me to mention something I didn't in the presentation. And this is really, really important to uh, emphasize, I think, to tenants. And that is, even if they achieve the protections of, uh, of this law, beginning February 1st, the law essentially in many ways uh, goes away and they'll be required at that point to pay their rent in full. So uh, the point being come, you know, if they owe rent on February 1st and they don't pay that rent, even though they submitted that declaration for January and December before that, um, they're no longer protected from eviction for that February rent if they don't pay it. So I uh, really just wanna emphasize, this is a short-term uh, sort of fix and kind of a bridge, a bridge opportunity to kind of help people stay in their homes. But um, I do emphasize that even if they're unable to pay their rent for this period of time and have earned those uh, protections, Come February first, um, you know the law really reverts to what it used to be pr prior uh, prior to uh, prior to AB thirty eighty eight and prior to the pandemic. Okay. Next question: What if the tenant also owes rent prior to March first? Another great question, and that is uh, once again AB thirty eighty eight is really laser focused on sort of COVID nineteen related financial impacts, and so with the pandemic really coming uh, 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 kind of coming into California widespread, uh, you know around March. March 1st is a, a cutoff date in the in the law. So the point being, if they owed rent prior to March 1st, um, technically a landlord could still then proceed with uh, an attempt to get them to pay or quit and then proceed with an eviction in court. Um, however, the one note I'll mention is that they won't be able to proceed with that until October 5th. Um, the law does require that essentially the court can't start doing these eviction processes for non-payment of rent until um, until October 5th, which, you know, at this point, right, is only six days away, but just flagging that, um, uh, you know, come October 5th, there might be an uptick then of tenants who are receiving sort of um, uh, an evictions notice or, or something from the courts about being evicted uh, for non-payment of rent that came due between before March 1st. And, uh, Phil, I know you touched upon the undocumented residents in your presentation, but reaffirming that with this question, if undocumented residents express concern about the small claims process, what can we tell them about the rights and protections? Does state law require that all residents be treated equally, regardless of immigration status? So uh, it's a great question. Uh, first and foremost, I would just say that um, uh, um, uh, immigration status and citizenship status is a protected class under, under the Fair Employment and Housing Act. So I, I know this is more about sort of interacting with the court system, but just pointing out that uh, landlords cannot discriminate based on um, your citizenship status. And so uh, tenants should be made aware of that. And uh, one of the resources we provide, you know, through the app and through other, uh, other resources that Lynn demonstrated is sort of that reference to the Department of Fair Employment and Housing, if somebody thinks they're actually being discriminated against on that basis. Um, but furthermore, in terms of the court process, um, essentially uh, a small claims court, uh, that, that really can't be part of the case. And again, immigration st uh, status is, is really never related to relevant to whether or not somebody should be evicted uh, or can be evicted. And so uh, that's, that's kind of one point I think that could be made. Um, but then also just want to point out um, that uh, there usually is a small claims court advisor uh, in each county who can help people sort of prepping for their case and can kind of go find out sort of what their options are. And so just um, pointing out that there are resources then within the courthouse typically that a, uh, um, 
uh, uh, somebody who's have those concerns can kind of access. And then also, of course, we can always refer them to Lauren's group to, for uh, further assistance. But uh, no, the small claims court typically is not a, a venue where, where that will be an issue at all or be relevant at all to the proceedings. Okay, next question. What do I do if my landlord tries to evict me anyway? Uh, get legal help. <laughs> get legal help. Um, but this also goes somewhat back to the S in safe, right? And that is, you know, until they have legally evicted you, you should stay in your home because a lot of uh, folks think for some reason they, they need to vacate. Um, and oftentimes that's premature. And in fact, they might have had a right that would have helped them stay in their home. So I think encouraging folks to stay in their home and then to also really, really encourage them to seek legal help so that they can really protect themselves. Um, and oftentimes too, right, um, there's other protections uh, in AB 3088, for instance, if a landlord takes unlawful actions like changing locks or taking things out of the home without, uh, without having first actually proceeded through, through the court uh, system, um, uh, there's some enhanced penalties for a landlord against that. But again, I think that the emphasis to a tenant, what they care about is they, they want to stay in their home and they probably don't want to be harassed either. So couple things, get legal help. And if they think they're being discriminated against, definitely reach out to Fair Employment and Housing. Next question, can I still be evicted for no cause? Great question. No, you can't, not until February 1st. Um, yes, so uh, no cause eviction is uh, describes uh, what I was talking about earlier when I was saying the other protections under AB 3088. They have to state a cause and it has to be a just cause is what we often call it in, in, in the law. But um, a cause has to be stated. So if it doesn't state any cause, the eviction can't go through at least until February 1st. And then even after February 1st, once again, I reemphasize seek legal help because there are new protections that went into effect last year um, that apply to many Californians that have been in their housing for a certain period of time that also would protect them uh, from sort of a no cause eviction situation. All right, and not to make you repeat yourself, but just reaffirming, can I still be evicted for a cause other than non-payment? Yes, yes, you can. However, you know, I think what's uh, kind of simple and nice about AB 3088 is it's really limited, right? There's only certain instances um, outside of non-payment of rent, and it's this discrete list of sort of what's called just cause reasons. Um, unfortunately, I'm forgetting off the top of my head what the bill number is. I want to say it's like uh, Civil Code 1942.2 two or five or something. But anyways, that said, uh, you know, uh, there's plenty of resources online, even if you just Google it, just cause protections in California. Um, it's a really discreet list. Um, and then the one other thing I'll point out though is on that list, the one that AB 3088 exempts is that a landlord cannot evict until February 1st also um, for uh, the intent to demolish or remodel the property you're occupying, unless it's required uh, for a health and safety reason or by order of a government entity. Um, but just pointing out that that also is not a valid reason um, to evict a tenant until February 1st. And I'm really impressed that you actually had something referenced, referencing that civil code right at the top of your head. I'm, I'm quite impressed with that. Uh, next question, does the 25% minimum payment to avoid eviction starting on February 1st of 2021 include utilities and other non-rent payments? That's a really good question. Um, I think 19, um, AB 3088 is written um, uh, to suggest that it's 25% of the rent due. However, this would be a situation where once again, I'd, I'd really advise the tenant to um, seek some legal help if they're gonna try to kind of really exercise this right of paying that 25% minimum. Um, again, because there may be actually other protections in their jurisdiction that might help them beyond uh, having to pay this amount. And then um, there's also uh, just always the chance that um, you know, uh, certain courts are coming to different interpretations. So as, as we kind of proceed with this new law and understand truly everything it means, um, that's something I think they'd wanna seek sort of individual legal advice on. All right, and the final question that I have here in front of me, do the protections apply to mobile homes? Yes, yes they do. So that's good news. <laughs> Specifically AB 3088 applies to mobile home uh, parks and mobile home uh, tenants. And as I pointed out, um, that can be both the situation where a mobile home owner rents a space in the mobile home park or a tenant rents a mobile home that's also happens to be located within a mobile home park. Great. All right, Phil and team, that are all the questions I have. And I think that's a wrap for our webinar here. I really want to thank all of you at the agency and the Legal Aid Association for your presentation, the hard work that you are doing now. I know for no one 
this was not in the job description starting in 2021 and it likely will be continuing obviously into the new year but thank you so much for all of your hard work on behalf of california and the information that you're providing to staff so thank you so much for the presentation and all the work and good luck to you and that is a wrap for this webinar i want to remind everyone that this webinar is being recorded and will be archived on the city intranet page so if you have in any way uh, missed any of this, or you want a colleague in your office, your Senate boss, whoever that wants to watch it, it will be archived on the, the webinar, or excuse me, on the intranet. So please feel free to check it out as soon as possible. And all links and PowerPoint presentations, all of that will be provided as asked for. So we've got you covered and all the information you need, hopefully, as you continue to counsel and assist constituents in your district on this new law. And that's it for this webinar. Uh, on behalf of Phil Laird and Lynn Von Koch Liebert and Amy Wilson and Miles White and Russ Heimrich with the California Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency and Lauren Klein and Rianne Pacheco from the <clears throat> Legal Aid Association of California. Thanks for watching everyone. I'm Brian Green from the State Capitol. Stay safe, take care. We'll talk to you soon.